Suppose we invent a machine that produces everything nearly free for us. The question is not that, that the stuff is produced free. Air is free. We don't complain about it. I mean, water is nearly free in most places. We don't complain about it. The question is, what is the distribution system? How do I get the income to afford it? If the production process does not generate income for me, then I can't afford it. So that is a, that's a more political economy question, not just a technology question. Sridhar Vembu has completely overturned the pyramid of what technological uh, advancement looks like. There's an idea that you must leave the villages and come to the metropolis to be a tech entrepreneur. But Sridhar Vembu has created a billion dollar company called Zoho, but using uh, uh, youth from rural India. He has a 15,000 strong uh, workforce. His head office is in Tenkasi, which is a small village in Tamil Nadu. He, uh, and he's taking on the, the biggest tech companies in the SaaS space by using rural Indians. And his philosophy is that technology must be deployed for the betterment of humanity. There's a different approach. Uh, Indian approach, a culture around technology which is very different from how it's expressed elsewhere in the world. And Sridhar Rembu is going to talk to us about what germinated that philosophy for him, how difficult it was to make this happen, and how replicable it is, and how significant it is for a country like India. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sridhar Rembu on stage. Sridhar, as I said, you've completely upturned the model of, uh, you know, the, the received notion about technological um, enterprise. First, before we even go into, you know, the, uh, the uh, sort of efficacies of it, would you tell us what prompted you to do this? You know, what, what made you, you were already in Silicon Valley and in America for 20 odd years. You came back in 2019. What made the shift in yeah. your head? First of all, uh, thank you for having me. Namaste. Wanakam to everyone. Um, so, um, I'll first give a more uh, narrower reason, which is I always pa have passion for R&D. Our company is very driven by R&D. Our nation, we have to invest a lot more in R&D. Because we are today consuming technology, dependent on a lot of technology, and we have to be in the value chain of producing the technology. That's very critical. So. And that's also very important for our rural development. So I call it R&D and RD. Sorry? R&D and RD, rural development. Because our rural, particularly rural citizens, have to participate in the technology creation, the technology value chain, so that we can consume the technology. That's the narrow reason, and I wanted to come back so that I can do this. We have already started doing this. We had started doing this. Now I, we are expanding all those efforts. Now, the broader reason is, well, we have climate change, which is an existential crisis. It's not a political issue. It's a scientific issue, and it's very clear now increasingly as year after year we are setting new records with floods and all of that. We just had big floods in our region last, last month. So, and, and historic floods, I mean, like never before seen floods. So, what are we going to do about all this, right? And that brings into question what is prosperity. And uh, this is where I think our own old ancient civilization has some answers. We'll say prosperity has to be rooted in contentment and humility. And that's only possible in this type of a rural setting. That's the broader reason why I came back. So both. So, right. Thank you. So, Sridhar, you know, again, before we go into your business vision and your, uh, you're also part of the National Security Advisory yeah. Board. Uh, led by Mr. Ajit Doval. So I do want to get into the security aspects of technology for a country like India. But there's also a personal... I actually, my term ended. I'm, I'm not a member now, but I was a member until about a few months ago. So right. Just to, yeah. So, but there's also a personal story, you know, about uh, what brought you back to India, and it's to do with your son. Would you share that with the audience and how it interlinks with, uh, you know, your, ex your emotional experience of coming back to rural India? Uh, do share uh, that. 
I have always been a very rural connected person, always, even from childhood. In fact, even though I grew up in Chennai, most of my own happiest moments were in my, back in my village. So I wanted to come back. That has been a plan since childhood. Finally, when I got the opportunity and I moved back, and even my U.S. life was very much a rural life. Your Actually, U.S. life was yeah, a rural? Yeah, even I, I was in the San Francisco Bay Area, but not quite in it. I was about an hour away. Uh, I had a small ranch with uh, goats for company, all that. So it's not uh, what typical American life is, what you would think. Once I found that, you know, I can move an hour away and I can have a small ranch and I did this, you know. So I've been living like that for 15 years, even there. So it's not a big change in a way. I mean, there you also have the same issues there as you have to take care of your own water, you have to take care of your own sanitation, all that. In very rural America, there are no services like that. And your own gas tank, you have to keep all that. So it's the same life here. So it's not any different. But the key difference is we have all the demographics. See, even in India, if you see the demographic, we, have, we are at almost replacement level as a nation. But you look at the urban versus rural, you'll see a vast gap. The urban uh, Indian birth rate is maybe one. The rural may be 2.5. It may average out to like two. So the future of our nation is very much, you know, in the rural. younger citizens and they are coming, being born in rural India. So we have to invest there. So that's, that's the, you know, uh, the overriding reason here. Right. You, of course, have publicly shared the story about your son, you know, autistic son. Uh, in fact, it plays a little bit into the story Liz was sharing when there was no therapies at all available for him. Uh, and the, the tension of that, you know, of, of when to stop, when to look. So I just wanted that mention because it kind of added an emotional, real life yeah. story, uh, which feeds back into what Liz was talking about, yeah. you know. And, and I took it as uh, the autism challenge as very similar to what the rural kids face too. Because if, even in our nation, if somebody from a rural place moves to Delhi or Bangalore, they are completely, you know, they feel totally alienated because they don't Sorry, know anything. They're completely they, they come from a rural area to Bangalore, Chennai, Delhi. There is a, like a, you know, it's a foreign territory for them because everything is new, everything is different. And language even, right, language challenge. Too many people speak English here and most Indians don't speak English. All these challenges. It is the same in autism, that it's a, it's a, it's a feeling of isolation. It's like you are trapped in your own world, right? So I saw a similarity between that and my own uh, way of doing this, how do we go there and, and provide a, you know, an economic foundation so people can stay where they are rooted rather than having to migrate. That's how I saw it. So, Sridhar, you know, all morning we've been talking about this big riddle of technology where at the one level it promises immense abundance and productivity and, uh, you know, efficiencies, conveniences which we're all benefiting from. At the other level, there's like a species scale shock of human displacement, technological unemployment, uh, etc. So, you know, what's your perspective on that? But I'm, you know, going to come back to your story about building uh, Zoho, but just because we've been talking about this issue, how do you think AI should be deployed in India? You know, you've spoken of technology not just operating in a vacuum, but that it has to generate employment. Yeah. But yeah. here comes a technology that cannot generate employment yeah. necessarily. How are you going to think about that? Uh, in one sense, here yeah, is a continuation of that. In fact, if you go to a textile spinning mill, I know I've visited a lot of them in Tirupur, Coimbatore Belt, the textile hub of uh, India now, you will see a huge factory, you know, many, many sizes of this floor. You'll see like two workers, you'll fully see. two workers, just two workers and all those machines, sophisticated machines. It take cotton and, and spin into yarn, from yarn into weave it into cloths. All these machines operating, you'll see a, a lot of uh, robotic arms doing stuff, very few workers. It's already true in that business, for example. All of the weavers have lost their jobs, now it's only. I, in fact, liken the software programmer's predicament. I said it in our company. We are today weaving together code manually. Very soon, maybe machines will weave our code. And they maybe do it 100 times better than we do. Like just like our hand loop weaver versus a power loom, air jet loom, all that, right? So that process has gone on in many other industries. 
it's now coming to what we think of as the intellectual businesses, including maybe lawyers to chartered accountants. AI could do a lot of it. Maybe you can make us 10 times more productive. And what are the job implications for it? But in another sense, I'm going to say, uh, you know, I, I take the analogy from the Star Trek replicator, science fiction. Suppose we invent a machine that produces everything nearly free for us. The question is not that, that the stuff is produced free. Air is free. We don't complain about it. I mean, water is nearly free in most places. We don't complain about it. The question is, what is the distribution system? How do I get the income to afford it? If the production process does not generate income for me, then I can't afford it. So that is a, that's a more political economy question, not just a technology question. In fact, our problem is we have decoupled the production technology, which is uh, all AI to automation, all that driven, from the distribution question, which is how does a consumer get the income to consume? This, to me, is not merely a technology question. It is a political economy question, which is why in India we see the freebie politics. In the US, there are actively people talking about UBI, the universal basic income. It's there in the West. These things have to be figured out in a holistic way. In fact, we have to rethink economics around, if you have separated production and consumption this way, what does economics mean? If I'm not going to get income from production, what does it mean? So these are the questions we have to ask. You know, you brought up so many issues that one, actually, I'd like to, though NDTV is our partner, but I'd like to quote an India Today uh, report, which is that they do this mood of the nation. And while Mr. Modi is, uh, you know, a very popular leader by and large, uh, there was 71% of respondents said that employment is a huge area of concern. And we've already had this 45 year high of, you know, uh, of n not enough employment growth. So uh, my question is that how should the government actually be thinking yeah. about this? You know, because this technology is going to come. Come, yeah. And you actually have been talking about these smaller models, which I brought up in a previous yeah. uh, session. But is that going to be plausible? Or are we preparing for a cataclysmic shock? Uh, I'll give you my speculative experimental answer. Why I'm saying it is, you know, I'm part of my experiments is to figure out some things here. I actually believe this technology of automation can be more miniaturized. We can bring small, we can build smaller scale factories that are fully automated. In other words, it doesn't have to be gigantic with local ownership, local distribution, all of that. So in other words, if a washing machine is so, uh, sold in a rural India, who makes it? Who owns the technologies behind it? Who gets the income? If the rural consumer is not part of the value chain of production, eventually they have to go into debt to consume. In other words, you can visualize it this way. Suppose one person owns all of the technologies, all the factories, they produce everything, and they don't create any employment at all. How does the rest of the world afford those goods? They have to go into debt to that person, basically because by, by assumption, they don't need anything from us. Then how do we buy from them? What do we give them? We give them our own debt. So that is the, this, this, this extreme example is nearly becoming true. If you go to a rural citizen today in India, they would have bought a motorcycle on installment, EMI payment. They would have bought a smartphone. They would have bought a, even a you know, fridge at home. They have three monthly payments, four monthly payments. They're caught in debt trap. Eventually they borrow and borrow and borrow. They lose their livelihood, they lose their land, all of that. This has to be thought through and, and that's why I said R&D has to be brought into rural area where this technology is the means of production has to be closer to who is consuming them. And that's part of my experimental tentative answer. I don't know if it can be done. I believe it can be done. I'm experimenting with it. So, so thank you. Uh, two two follow-on questions to this. One is that you yourself are an investor in technologies. You know, one, you're trying to create new AI technologies. Yeah. You even spoke about doing a language model of your own, but yeah. typically it costs 10, 15 billion dollars to create a model, but you're talking about much more smaller contained ones. No, the 10, 15 billion dollars is the infrastructure, the GPU cost, the GPU. but I believe that will come down. Competition is coming. For example, NVIDIA is the GPU leader today, but AMD has some good technologies. So yeah. we are evaluating those. So eventually these things will be figured out. I don't believe the semiconductor part of it, which is where most of the money is going. It's not actually going to R&D. 
meaning there is one sense you figure out the models, the other you are deploying them at scale. Most of the money is going to the second part. Right. So, and, and that cost should come down, hopefully. When you were talking about it coming down, at this moment, Sam Altman is talking about uh, starting a GPU semiconductor yeah. and he's trying to raise $7 trillion yeah. for it. So I don't, I mean, right now it doesn't sound a cheap proposition at all. But coming back to, you know, which are the areas in which you're optimistic that AI in an Indian context, uh, and you know, I was reading about some very interesting initiatives that you're banking. Um, uh, again, it's a hall full of a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. You mentioned Sam Altman. I want to, I want to actually bring it back to that political economy too. He has a blog post, it's well worth reading, samaltman.com. He talks about, in an AI fully automated world, he talks about UBI, universal basic income. He's a major proponent of it, because he recognizes the problem. If everything is automated, how will people get the income to consume? So he proposes UBI by taxing the AI company. That's how the government will fund it. That's his idea, and that's there in his very blog, samaltman.com. Now, you are a question. I am an actually optimist about technology and all this. I'm not a pessimist. I don't think we need an UBI. If we can figure out the, the question of who creates the technology, who gets income from it, those problems. And now, in the Indian context, you know, just our vast nation unifying it through automatic translation. I speak on the phone in Tamil and somebody speaks in Indian, we can understand each other. All of these technologies are very useful. I, and I'm, I'm very confident we are going to figure all that out. I mean, those will become into small chips that are very cheap and that will be in every phone. The question is who derives the income? How does the income reach the consumer to consume that product? That is the critical question. And to me, the optimist in me says, we have the vast brain power in rural areas. Youth Sorry? Talent, vast brain power among our youth in rural areas. We can tap them to produce these technologies, whether it's AI, semiconductors, all that. Two days ago, I was in Trivandrum. I was in Digital University of Kerala. A small team, about a 30, 40 member team, has created an AI chip that works as an edge device. And this is something that you don't hear of that it's done in India. They've created the chip. They got it fabbed in TSMC in Taiwan. It's a 28 nanometer chip. I was very impressed by what they had done. This is a small team in the university in Kerala. So we have the talent. We just have to present into service to invent these technologies. Right. So, you know, I want to come back to that UBI question, but could you share the experience of setting up Zoho from Tenkasi? Yeah. How, you know, it's very easy for us to sit on stage and say, wow, you did this. Uh, but it is very difficult to acculturate people, to change mindsets, uh, to educate, you know, to skill. Uh, so, and this is barely a three, four year old story. Of course, your company predates you coming back yeah. to India. But tell us the experience of actually uh, hooking up rural Indian youth to this and how tough was it? Yeah. And is it replicable or does it require yeah. a personal passion of Sridhar Vembu? Uh, see, you go to Bangalore, you go to a tech company, let's say they have 100 engineers, you'll find that at least 50 of them, maybe 60 of them have a rural background, even today. I'm sure it's true in uh, 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 Gurgaon, I'm sure it's true anywhere in India. You come to Chennai, the same thing is true. So if you actually look at the engineers we employ even in Chennai, maybe 60% actually have a rural background. So the source of the talent is coming from there. So for us, it was natural to go where the supply is coming from. Why bring them to Chennai with all the cost of living, traffic, and all of the problems? Why not go where people already are? That's, that was the original insight. The second is we know, we knew all along that we have to invest in training. And then we hired instructors training, learning by doing, all of that, and it works. It already worked in Chennai. The same rural talent is producing the software, now they just get to do it in their own settings. That's the only difference. So it's not, from that perspective, it's not a big deal for me, so, to right. think about this. <laughs> so this question about universal basic income, uh, you know, I'm just speaking from a personal perspective. I've always been a pro-welfare state, particularly in a country like India, that everyone must have an equal uh, platform of opportunity. Yeah. But, and redistribution of wealth is really important. But now it's a bit worrying, because like you said, those who are capturing, because of their technological innovation, but they've also excavated all of public human mind to corner that wealth and data. But, uh, you know, high capitalists are now very pro-universal basic income. And that becomes a bit worrying, 
because there's almost like a structural preparation for extreme concentration of wealth, you know? You're not even thinking how to solve this problem. You're saying it's going to happen, and now let's give, you know, it's like that old Marie Antoinette story, they can't have cake, so let's give them the bread, but we are going to take the cake, you know? So it's almost become, and I wonder what kind of a society will it be yeah. where all of us, and who's going to determine what is that threshold which can count as UBI? Am I going to get a UBI yeah. when I get displaced? And am I okay with the fact that there's going to be such concentration of wealth? Yeah. And there's a buy-in from this from everybody. So I find it a very worrying proposition. What would your so take on? You raised some very, very good questions. And I, um, to put this concentration in perspective, uh, the profit of Apple is about $300 million per day, operating profit per day. Microsoft is about $250 million. Google is about $250 million. Facebook is about $150 million per day. These are daily numbers, every single day weekends included. And this is the scale of the profit in technology. NVIDIA is getting there now, right? And then you go to the next year, it'll drop by factor of 10. You go to the next year, another factor of 10. That's how concentrated even our industry is today, right? Very quickly, in fact, 90% of the profits are probably going to the top three firms today. That's, that's true now, right? And is this absolutely inevitable? There is, first of all, in the US, now antitrust has woken up. They are blocking some of the mergers. For example, should Google have been allowed to acquire YouTube? I'm so sorry. Google, should Google have been allowed to acquire YouTube? Should Facebook have been allowed to acquire WhatsApp? These are now questions US is asking. They are recently blocking mergers and acquisitions now, finally. They may even break up those companies. So it's not, in other words, we should not think that everything is only a technology question. These are very much political economy questions. For example, in India, we may not have to allow these mergers and acquisitions. If Zoho wants to monopolize, we want to acquire every competition, the government maybe should not allow us, you know? So that's what I think these are all, there is governance issues involved. If we answer those correctly, maybe UBA is not needed. Because I also, I actually don't believe every citizen should be given UBI and they don't have the dignity of their own work earning their income. I don't think that's a good idea, so. You know. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to ask this question about um, the fact that when, when we're thinking about this future of society, and uh, there's a lot of discussion now about the fact that there's nothing fixed even about the idea of work, you know? That in the past, uh, we thought uh, feudal society was the only construct. And they're really deep people now thinking and putting a lot of money into it to imagine a world without work. And then there's this talk that your purpose would come from something else, yeah. you know? So when we're going on talking about work and uh, wage labor, <clears throat> that this is an old idea. What would your take on that be? Yeah. Um, see, I, I said it, if everything is actually free, actually absolutely free, the replicator, humans will always find something else to do. In fact, uh, I'll tell you one example of what humans would do. And uh, they were already doing it. Three days ago, I was in a, a local temple festival. It was a four-hour festival. And I had no phone. I mean, I left the phone and I was in the festival. I was in the float, which is going around the pond with the deity, all of that, three hours. And it was completely immersive time, you know, spiritual experience, all of it. This is how humans will do. And we could have people who sing in temples. We, have, we could have people who are dancing in temples. All of those jobs, right? Those are jobs. In other words, humans will find things to do. That's not my problem. The socio-economic question is, if I have to pay for it, do I have the income? If the iPhone is completely free, I don't have a problem, right? But if I have to pay for it, do I have the income? Or am I going into debt? So we have to keep focusing on that question. Then the answers will reveal itself. It's not that fundamentally it being free affects us in any way. That's why I said air is free and, and, and essential things are free and we don't worry about those being free. But we have to solve the socio-economic question. So just the last question is that this issue about innovation, you know, whether it's in the medical space or the technological space, when you were talking that these large companies should not have the monopolies and they had antitrust cases now against a lot of them. But the other conundrum is that for this level of innovation is very, very capital intensive. And so sometimes you need large structures to really have that patience for innovation. You know, like AI has been gestating for many yeah. years. Uh, so if you only focus on small models, 
while that's much more socially acceptable, feels calmer. But at another level, innovation possibly requires this level of monopolization. Uh, would that would be their argument. That's a false argument. I'm in technology. That's a false oh. argument. I'm in the technology business. That's convenient bullshit. I'm going to tell you. Because you don't need actually the, the scale of profits tower over any meaningful R&D investments today. We're talking about 120, 100 billion profits. We're talking about 10 billion R&D investments. So anybody who's numerate will understand the numbers, see through it immediately. So it's a false argument, trust me. I'm in technology, I don't believe it. So. <laughs> so. Uh, we have one other speaker in our session who's uh, in, in, in our conference called Jaren Lanier. And he calls out a lot of what he calls the bullshit of technology. And he says, I created virtual reality. So nobody can tell me that I don't know my tech. You know? You're very much in that space. And thank you, thank you for this very thought-provoking session. Thank you. I look forward to having lunch and then coming back for another array of questions. Thank, thank you, you very much. And uh, namaskaram to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>